Good morning. My name is Ingrid Kalangwaire. Excellencies, today we gather here at the Kigali Genocide Memorial to honor the memory of the victims of the genocide against the Tutsi. On this day, 30 years ago, over 1 million innocent lives were brutally taken in 100 days, with 250,000 souls finding the, their final resting place here at this memorial. You're joining millions of other Rwandans who are laying wreaths in countless memorials and graves throughout the country and abroad in remembrance of the lives that we've lost. Excellence, aujourd'hui vous rejoignez des millions d'autres Rwandais à travers le pays et au-delà pour honorer la mémoire de plus d'un million de victimes du génocide contre les Tutsis, dont 250 000 ont trouvé leur dernier demeure ici, dans ce lieu dédié à leur mémoire. Excellency, in a moment, you will lay down your wrist to honor the victims of the genocide against the Tutsi. I would like to request the military band to guide us in this important moment. Excellencies, we invite you all to take a step forward towards the wrist and pay respect to the victims of the genocide against the Tutsi. Please take a moment of reflection as the military band plays the rivari. Excellencies, thank you for honoring the lives, the innocent lives we've lost. Please proceed to the lighting of the flame of remembrance. Thank you.
Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Rwanda and First Lady, this is the moment to light the flame of remembrance, Urumuri Gwichize. This flame symbolizes not only our past, but the hope for tomorrow. It will keep burning for the next 100 days. Thank you, Your Excellencies, for guiding us as we conclude the first part of our commemoration event. The commemoration event will continue at BK Arena. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Murakoze, merci beaucoup.
banyacubahero bashitsi bahere muterane hano mukanya turakiranya kuba president of republica na madamu nabashitsi bari kumwe
as we welcome our host, His Excellency President Paul Kagame and First Lady Jeannette Kagame, we kindly ask that we all rise for the national anthem and that we remain standing for the moment of silence. Remain standing for the moment of silence. You may be seated. Excellencies, we have live interpretation for you today. Please tune to channel one for English, channel two for French, channel three for Arabic, and channel four for Portuguese. Le canal one pour l'anglais, le canal two pour le français, le canal three pour l'arabe, et le canal four pour le portugais. Nyakuwaha President of the Republic of Madam, Wanyachiwe Romutera Nihano, Wachitsi Vahire, Chuti Zurugwanda, Wanyarugwanda, Wanyarugwanda Kazi. Mudukuri Chiekuri Radio, Televizio, Nukumbuga Nkona Yemanyambaga, Nwara Mutse. Nitu kwa mkura rinda Alain Bernard, Hamadou Mvujizi, Uwanjirije, Wa Guvernoma. Nyakuwaha Monsieur le Président, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are now commemorating for the 30th time uh, the genocide against the Tutsi. We are gathered here representing the international community and remembering that uh, that uh, uh, genocide uh, killed more than a million people. Call observed. My name is Sandrine Omotone. I am the Minister of State for Youth and Arts. We are honored to welcome you all, Rwandans and friends of Rwanda, present here at home across our country and all over the world on this solemn day of our 30th commemoration. As we remember more than one million men women and children slain during the 100 days of the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. We now invite you to turn your attention to the illuminated tree. The tree's branches and foliage 
represent the protection that targeted families could not find during the genocide and that Rwandans today can count on. The upright trunk echoes the aspirations of the young generation, reinforced by the internal light and flowing sap of life within. The roots illustrate the memory of the past that we must preserve, our shared Rwandan culture on which we are all anchored and from which we draw inspiration and strength to reach for the sky as we build a brighter future. Muri Mwanya, Mureketwa Chiri, Minister Uvanyi Namahanga, Dr. Ruta Vincent, Arakuri Chirgwa, and Minister Umwe, Governor Gwanda, Nishinga Nomone Jugu, Dr. Jean Damasen Viziman. Excellence, Monsieur le Ministre, la parole est à vous. Your Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda, and First Lady Jeanette Kagame, Your Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Heads of Delegations, Heads of International Organizations, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all to the national ceremony marking the 30th commemoration of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. We extend our deepest gratitude for your presence here. Your solidarity in this moment of commemoration honors the memory of those we lost 30 years ago and reaffirms our collective commitment to ensure that such a tragedy doesn't happen again. I would like to recognize the leaders and friends as well as distinguished guests who are with us in this arena for our Kwibuka 30. Son Excellence, le Président de la République du Congo. His Excellency, the President of the Republic of South Sudan and Chairperson of the East African Community. Son Excellence, le Président de la République Centrafricaine. His Excellency the President of the Republic of South Africa. His Excellency the Prime Minister of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia and the First Lady. Son Excellence le Président de la République de Madagascar et Madame la Première Dame. Son Excellence le Président de la République Islamique de Mauritanie et Président en exercice de l'Union Africaine. His Excellency the President of the Republic of Mauritius and the First Lady. Her Excellency the President of the United Republic of Tanzania. His Excellency the President of the State of Israel. His Excellency the President of the Czech Republic. The Right Honorable Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Lesotho. His Excellency, the former President of the United States of America, Mr. Bill Clinton. Son Excellence, Madame la Première Dame de la République de Guinée. Son Excellence, Madame la Vice-Présidente de la République du Bénin. Her Excellency, the Vice-President of the Republic of Uganda. Her Excellency, the Vice-President of the Republic of Zambia. His Excellency the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. His Excellency the Vice President of the Republic of the Gambia. Her Excellency the Speaker of the Assembly of the Republic of Mozambique. The Honorable Speaker of the House of Commons of Canada. Son Excellence Madame la Première Dame, la Première Ministre, excusez-moi, de la République Togolaise. Son Excellence, Monsieur le Chef du Gouvernement du Royaume du Maroc. Son Excellence, Monsieur le Premier Ministre de la République Gabonaise. His Excellency, the former President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Dr. Orushegun Obasanjo. 
His Excellency, the former President of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Tabombeki. His Excellency, the former President of the Federal Republic of Germany, Dr. Horst Kerler. Son Excellence, l'ancien président de la République française, Monsieur Nicolas Sarkozy. His Excellency, the former Prime Minister of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, Mr. Haile Mariam de Salen. Son Excellence, Monsieur le Président du Conseil européen. Son Excellence, Monsieur le Président de la Commission de l'Union africaine. The President of the African Development Bank. The Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Madame la Secrétaire Générale de la Francophonie. The Secretary General of the East African Community. The Director General of UNESCO. I would also like to recognize the countries that sent ministerial delegations as well as high-level representatives. Those are Algeria, Angola, Belgium, the Bahamas, Botswana, Canada, Chad, China, Comoros, Cote d'Ivoire, Denmark, Djibouti, Egypt, Equatorial Guinea, Iswatini, France, Guinea, India, the Republic of Korea, Mali, Malawi, the Netherlands, Qatar, Sao Tome and Principe, Serbia, Somalia, Sudan, Sweden, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, and the United Kingdom. Thank you for standing with Rwanda today, for remembering with us, and for your continued support as we take this journey forward. Murakoze, je vous remercie. Thank you. Nyakubahwa President wa Republika ba nyakubahwa bakuru b'ibihugu na za guverinoma n'imiryango mpuza mahanga states and international organizations the dignitaries who came here to be with us in these times I thank you for this opportunity for me to give you a brief summary of what characterized the genocide against Tutsis, as we commemorate for the 30th time. I will focus on the international community's role that enabled the genocide. And today, we still think there's need for change uh, in, to prevent genocide internationally. And I will continue in French. We commemorate the extermination of more than a million Tutsis uh, that states could have prevented. The United Nations recognized this horrible number in the resolution 2150 of 16 April 2014, say, uh, mentioning three elements here, saying it, there are unclear proofs that acts of genocide were committed against the Tutsi group. More than a million people were killed in that genocide and uh, we take note of that and we are concerned given all forms of genocide. July 7, 2000, an inquiry commission by the, the African Union under His Excellency Ketumile Masire, former president of Botswana, published his report called a genocide that could have been prevented. This report clarifies the African Union's responsibility. It says this, genocide that happened in Rwanda could have been prevented by those from the international community who were in position and who had the means to do so. However, those did not have the will and did not have the means 
End of quote. December 15, 1999, the United Nations Commission under Mr. Ingvar Carson, former Prime Minister of Sweden, published a similar report uh, concluding like this. It's uh, the United Nations as a system, uh, they, they bear the responsibility to, to not have known how to prevent or to end the genocide in Rwanda. Your Excellences, before the genocide against Tutsis in 1994, the United Nations and its member states had had all necessary information to act on time. August 11, 1993, the United Nations Human Rights Commission published a, a, a report that concluded like this. The Tutsi population is targeted by large-scale massacres by the Rwandan armed forces, administrative authorities, and militia. The Tutsi victims are the majority of those targeted, and they are targeted just because of their ethnic group. These killings are clearly a genocide. That was eight months before the genocide. On May 18, 1994, a delegation of the genocidal government with uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jerome Chamomaka, and uh, the extremist party uh, CDR leader, Jean Bosco Barayaguiza, attended the Security Council meeting. They participated in debates, distorting facts, and imputing responsibilities to the Rwandan Patriotic Front accusing them of having committed a genocide against Hutus. Hutus. The consequence was that in the 918 resolution voted on the same day, the use of the term genocide was refused. One will have to wait until June 8, 1994 for the United Nations to use that word timidly, speaking of acts of genocide. And in the meantime, Zaire, the today's Democratic Republic of Congo, was al allowing the genocide, genocidal government to buy weapons via different states and uh, dealers. On June 22, 1994, United Nations, under France's pressure, authorized the, the Turquoise operation, which helped genocide uh, genociders to to move and uh, settle in Zaire. In July 1994, the genocide, genociders were defeated by the Rwandan Patriotic Front. On October 30th, 1994, those genociders formed a government with the president and the prime minister who have committed the genocide, masterminded the genocide. There was uh, uh, General Bezimongu, was uh, chief of staff of the genocidal army in the same government. The Minister of Defense became Colonel Atanas Gasake, who headed, before the genocide and during the genocide, he headed what they call civil defense force that used to distribute weapons to militia. His deputy became Colonel Vagosora, who is the the, the mastermind of the genocide. And on April 3rd, 19, uh, 1995, they created a political party that they called uh, Rassemblement pour Etude de la Democratie, RDR, with uh, an ethnist and uh, a, a genocide denying ideology. The genocide administration. Uh, reconstituted in Zaire, the FDLR, who are active today in DRC, are, were born from that system. But 
many international resolutions requiring the dismantling uh, of that force and uh, taking them to justice have not have been neglected. One example here. Resolution 2150 of the Security Council voted on April 16, 2014, requires this of states. First, draw lessons of the genocide perpetrated in 1994 against Uzis. And two, conduct uh, an inquiry about the facts, arrest and uh, arrest and extradite genocide fugitives who are on their territory, including FDLR leaders. And three, the Security Council condemns the denial of that genocide. On January 10, 2005, during its 23rd Summit of Heads of State held in Libreville, in Gabon, the African Union voted a resolution which is identical uh, to that one about the FDLR. On May 14, 2008 and December 8, 2010, the European Union adopted similar resolutions, which today remain un unapplied. They, they are not applied even today. Germany took an, an important act when they arrested and uh, prosecuted uh, and uh, sentencing in 2015 two respons uh, political politicians of the FD from the FDLR, including Nias Munyashiaka and Straton Musoni. The latter was uh, returned to Rwanda in 2022 at the end of, uh, he, uh, after having served his sentence, and he lives peacefully in his uh, native country. Mugwana Hyaka died in a German prison in 2019. Belgium sent to Rwanda in 2018 Major Bernard Nuyahaga after the end of his 20-year sentence for genocide. He had been uh, found guilty of murder, the murder of the 10 Belgian uh, Blue Helmets, uh, Belgian UN forces, uh, forces in 20, uh, during the genocide. The states state still hesitate to send genocide suspects, but they should learn from those examples. Having said that, how will Rwandans understand the fact that Colonel Alois Simba's body, who was uh, found guilty of genocide by the ICTR and uh, sentenced to 25 years, was transferred secretly to the United States on Ju in July 30th, 2023. How will understand that FDLR elements who assassinated eight Western tourists in Rwindi Park National Park in Uganda on March 1st, 1999, were arrested later on by Rwandan judicial system and extradited to the United Nations, to the United States, but they were later on sent to live freely in Australia without any trial. In November, in November 20, uh, 1994, during debates at the UN about the creation of the ICTR, Ambassador Carol uh, Kovander, representing the Czech Republic at the Security Council, Council had underlined the urgent priority to send a force at that time to neutralize genociders and to return them to Rwanda. He was not heard. 30 years later, the, the FDLR crimes are still going on today. Today, we see similar international indifference similar to that that prevailed in Rwanda between 1990 and 1994. Uh, are we looking for another million of dead people to act? This would be a shame that this commemoration should help and is calling to stop. I thank you, Your Excellencies. Monsieur le Ministre, Merci pour ces quelques mots.
qui relate les étapes de notre histoire. And now, excellencies, distinguished guests, Excellence. we will hear the first of three musical interludes of songs originally created for past commemoration ceremonies. Today, those will be performed by a new generation of artists as a symbol of intergenerational transmission for the preservation of memory. I would now like to invite Kenny Mirasano and Christian Hukuru to perform a medley of the songs Iwuka, originally sung by Suzanne Niranyamibka and never again sung by Masamba in Nori. Abahanzi Barakoze, Excellencies, distinguished guests, we will now hear from Louise Ayingamie, a survivor who was living in Nyange in the western province of Rwanda when the genocide started. Mrs. Louise will be with us momentarily. Thank you. Kose, Yakua Prisdor Purika, 
Mr. President, my name is Louisa Inhamie from uh, the Western <laughs> Province, <laughs> province in Ngororero District, <laughs> Anyanje uh, Village. <laughs> At that time, it was uh, the, province, the prefecture of Kibuye, uh, the commune of Kivumu, before the system was changed. I'm married and a mother of five. Mr. President, let me announce here that what is going to be uh, said, what I'm going to say, was experienced by a 10 year old. I was very young. I was five. A lot of things that happened to me, I didn't understand them. I understood them later. We were six siblings, six girls, six boys, uh, about three girls, three boys. We lived a normal life of um, an ordinary family. But uh, the only difference was that we were Tutsi by ethnicity. And therefore, we lived in constant insecurity. In the Chibirira district, uh, between, uh, between 10 and 15, uh, uh, more than 350 people in my neighborhood were killed, including my family. So I started feeling that maybe I don't have a right to live. Every night they will come, every night they sh shout at our door, and they will hear whistles, whistles. And then our parents would uh, try and uh, take us by the back door to the church or to a, a classroom somewhere to, to, to hide. I remember that even when I was at school, as a school girl, we, we were two Tutsis at that time, two surviving Tutsis. And the teacher would say, Tutsis, stand up. And the Tutsis would stand up. We would stand up. And I couldn't understand that. Because they will point fingers at us. And uh, we were excluded. It's like we were not part of the community. We were ashamed because we were uh, fingered. Now, on the 7th, April, we were at home. home. It was announced that uh, President Habyarimana had died. But of course, I was too young to understand what that meant. It was a very sad, but I could see that other people were, were very frightened. There was a panic. The parents, the children, by that time, we were five children at home. And uh, mom and dad. Uh, no, dad was not there because he had gone to visit, to, to visit a relative who was ill. So actually, the genocide started you know, without him. He, he, he couldn't leave Kabgai where he'd gone to see his relative. And that's how he survived. And uh, the, the rest of us, the rest of my family died. There was also another uh, sibling who had traveled. He also survived. And we had uh, an aunt who was uh, a nun in a convent in Mukarangi. She also survived. But on the seventh, we had another relatives, you know, other people, uh, relatives who uh, on another hill across ours. There were a lot of people in that family, M many members of that family uh, that we knew. They were all decimated. So, my sister said, I'm a Baptist, and we were raised in the church. She said to us young people, she said, go to the church of Nyanje, go to the parish church. I said, why don't I go to my godmother? 
because I had just been uh, baptized and I had gold mother. And I said, oh, if I could go to my godmother, I think I would survive. Because the church, uh, there is no use in going to the churches because people have been uh, massacred in churches. So mother said, well, in any case, oh, I want to go wherever you think so. So I did. Uh, two of my brothers were, were outside. They were hiding in the cattle. They were tending the cattle. And those went their own way. I also went my way. And uh, my sister saw me going. And she said, well, go. go if we survive, we'll meet again. But she died. Mm -hmm. And she died. I never saw her again. I come here to Kuchirizia. So I walked to the church with my younger brother was with me, my younger brother, and we went to the family of my godmothers. Uh, let me just uh, come back and explain what happened to those who went to hide in the church. I wasn't there, but we told the story to see if anybody had survived. But in fact, all we had was they are dead. So and so died this way. So they were shunned. I heard that my sister took my younger, my younger brother, who was very sick, or rather very hungry. So they said, "Well, we're going to the convent. We have a sister is there, or aunt is there. Let's go." So they went. So the little boy. The little boy, when uh, they had given him the food uh, that he needed, refused to go back to the church with my sister. So my sister went, so there were the others, you know, the, the other relatives. And uh, in fact, uh, other, my father on his side had also arranged for hiding places for the young, or for the, the children, so that they could not all die together. So anyway, those who were in the church uh, tried to fight off the attackers who were attacking the church. But they, they resisted for a long time. But the parish priest of the, the father said, Father said, He himself decided that they should destroy the church instead so that all the are killed because it's very difficult to kill them one by one. So they destroyed the church, and that was the end of my family. You just, you just fed, you know, it, it fell over them. So I thought I was the only survivor. I was, uh, as I explained, that I had gone to my godmother's house. She and her husband. Uh, the thing is that uh, the, kid, the husband was uh, a teacher. The wife was uh, a court clerk. Even for relatives. And one was from. They were not from the same area, but they were not. They, 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 their origin. Places of origin was not very far. But uh, anyway, I wasn't. I was, uh, fine at that time at, uh, at her house. But we also persecuted uh, the Rukam and threw us out and uh, beat us up. But by the way, I forgot to say that the husband of my godmothers, he, he said to me, when they ask you who you are, Say you are the daughter of so-and-so who is on holiday here. 
So, okay, it's fine. Okay. So, when, uh, they will, they will come, you know, the attackers will come, you know, with the, the machetes and uh, swords and uh, uh, all sorts of weapons and spears and so on. And they will come, attack the house, take everything, break what they can take, uh, saying that they are looking for my, my godmother who was hiding from them because uh, they did what they could to, to, to protect me. Sometimes they spend the whole night taking uh, those who have run to them, hiding them in the bushes, then having to move them to another place and so on. And they, they try their best because they too had been, uh, had been attacked and the food was, uh, there was no food, it was horrible. Anyway, a day came when somebody came and said, now this is your day, and I don't think we can hide you anymore. So they, somebody came and said, let me go and hide her. So I went away with that person. They said, we, we have to go and uh, hide that person to that house, to the house over there. That will be probably safer. But we went to that house, and the, the, the woman had lost her husband and her children as well. She the, the, the survivor. So we left that place. We had to we try to hide somewhere else. And we met another group of uh, uh, in Herahamne, but uh, I managed to hide <laughs> from them. And uh, I continued to find uh, hiding places. So that lasted the whole month of April, and then May, and then we were at the beginning of June. So the, 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 the rumor started to run around that uh, now the Ingo Tanyi, RPF have come and uh, in here are starting to run but before running they uh, killed whoever they couldn't uh, they couldn't kill my uh, my, my godmother who was a Tutsi and her father her husband was a Tutsi the husband had tried his best to protect us and hide his wife and so on but in the end it was very difficult it was very difficult. The, 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 the second family that I had tried to hide with had to leave the house. So they walked to a place called Rufungo, and they found a, a roadblock, you know, those roadblocks manned by uh, Inherahamwe terrorists, and they killed them. And uh, we were still hiding, uh, managed to hide, but I can't co uh, continue with some other children that I could find who were also, were also orphans, small, smallish children. And they said, the elder daughter said, so anyway, we, were, the, 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 we went to a house, we found a house to hide where there was nobody except the children who had managed to hide. And then uh, uh, these, these children said, what do I do? Uh, what, what, what do I do to find food? So somebody said, well, why don't you go to the convent? There's a conf convent over there. So I went to the convent. When I go to the convent, I found that uh, uh, we found a, a car by the convent. Somebody put us in the car, in a pickup, and uh, covered us with their uh, tarpaulin, uh, you know, and, uh, and then drove us away and kept saying that this is just his, uh, his luggage, his goods. These are just his goods in the car. So I went to upstairs. I reached the barrier. I didn't know whether the people I was uh, with were Hutus or Tutsis. I didn't know who they were. I was just walking, just walking away. And uh, none of my family were there. Even my fa my brother, who eventually survived, I didn't know where he was. So I was alone with these uh, people. So I I, I sat down. Uh, you know, I, I moved aside from the group. I sat down on a stone, and I started crying. And a woman came by, 
And she said, stop crying. What is, uh, why are you crying? He said, well, I don't know where to go, I have nobody. She said, don't worry. Even all these people have nobody, uh, just like you, just walk, just go on, just try to run away, don't give up. So I did, and uh, eventually we, we just sort of moved uh, to a place following others, and we found a place where we could find uh, or we could hide, rather. But they said, don't go further. There are uh, groups of uh, in Herahamge who are on rampage over there, and they are killing all the survivors. So somebody said, OK, let's stay here. And then staying here, I started being afraid, because I could hear the shouts. And then, in any case, I said, how can I stay here? I don't know anybody. These people are strangers. I'm sure all my family is dead. But anyway, uh, I wasn't. Somebody said, well, stay here. Say, you can't go anywhere. Anyway, eventually, we found a, a car. Somebody came, took us in a car. It was a pickup, but we, 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 see, we were not covered. They said, just go on. Just go on. So they dropped us somewhere. And then they said, just walk, walk. So as we walked past that, uh, we saw uh, there were trucks of, uh, and they were, we were explained that these are in Hotani, these are FPR, uh, RPF, because we were in the, in the turquoise zone, and there had been an agreement uh, for uh, RPF to be allowed to pick up the refugees who were in that zone. So. So here, I thank, uh, I thank you, Mr. President, because this is how we were saved. Anyway, they took us somewhere, on a safe place, and eventually heard that my, my mother had survived, that one of my brothers had survived, that uh, one of the elder brothers had joined uh, the RPF, and he had also, he was also there, he was uh, survived. Eventually, well, let me just conclude that uh, we were rescued, we were helped, I went back to school, I went uh, to university as well. Even university, the university degree, I got it myself, I paid for myself, so that's my life. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for uh, putting an end to the genocide, giving us back our life. Today, I have a, my, my elder child is 11. The age I had when, well, during the genocide. He's healthy, he's okay, he's not destroyed like I was. He's just a fine uh, young person. And uh, thanks, that's thanks to you. Thank you very much. And we want to promise that uh, we survivors, we are strong. We build the country. We'll do it together. Thank you very much. Good commemoration. Louise Komira, Turiho. Thank you for your grace. Well, thank you for your, for your testimony. Excellencies, honorable guests, nous allons à présent assister à une représentation artistique intitulée The Gift of Time, qui reprend en trois temps l'histoire de notre pays. Merci beaucoup. Ce morceau de danse contemporaine regroupe des jeunes artistes provenant de différentes troupes de danse de notre capitale. Sous la direction de M. Wesley Ruziriza et avec la collaboration. We now hear another a song performance. Serve toi, Hirwa, Samuel Kamanzi, Cédric Mizero et Sisi Uera, who are going uh, to tell in an artistic form what happened during the genocide and what happened after the genocide and what is happening now where our generations are now doing well with no fear 
no terror. Thank you. Nyakubo ha President of Republic, tujiye gukuri chira na ijihangano charu ziviza wesle. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, Mr. President, we're now going to hear young people tell the story of the genocide, how it started, how it will continue, how we, we, uh, we moved like blindfolded people into a genocide. But tomorrow, the future the immediate future is bright. And this is what these people are going to tell in their art form. Nous sommes ici et we are here because we survived, even though we lost our loved ones. But we also remember that even the young ones were killed. But we're here to honor you because we've survived. Please receive our offer, our performance. Uh, please remember us as we are struggling and striving to leave. It was almost a hundred days. This lasted for about a hundred days. Only tears and darkness. Rest. Stand up. Stay strong.
Slowly, we've been trying to move forward together with others, trying to rebuild our nation.
ntituzatatira igihango dufitanye kivijyanye tuzacyuza We remember We remember We remember Nous nous souvenons Nous nous souvenons Nous nous souvenons Turibuka 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 Abahanzi Barakose, nous allons à présent écouter les messages de solidarité de nos distingués invités. Excellence, Monsieur Moussa Faki. Your Excellency Moussa Faki Mohamed, President of the African Union Commission, please come forward and give your remarks. Excellence, Your Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, heads of states, governments, and delegations. Excellences, the First Ladies, Excellencies, heads of international and regional organizations. Distinguished guests, dear brothers and sisters, Rwandans, ladies and gentlemen, it's always uh, a powerful moment with a thousand and one intense emotions, deep questions, and uh, feelings of admiration each time we set foot on this country that emerge from its ashes. The genocide against Tutsis that we commemorate for the 30th time today is means all of that to me. 30 years ago, horror struck Rwanda. Murderous forces fueled by ethnic ideologies, spread hatred, a speech of hatred among the population of this beautiful country known for its uh, mild climate and the greenery on its hills. And as a result, within three months, more than a million Tutsis were decimated during unbelievably horrible conditions, inhumane conditions. And after that horrible catastrophe, tragedy, we are still questioning, asking questions, asking ourselves even about the absurdity and uh, the uh, craziness that our humanity has manifested. How and why? To, for what purpose? What thirst do you quench by exterminating others? What will be, what will be able to say or do today? First, to accomplish our duty to remember. There has to be remembrance. You have to remember so you don't forget. You have to also remember to understand the depth of these wounds inflicted on this nation. And you need to remember to measure the bestiality manifested by men that led them 
to destroy human dignity with intra-family crimes and other crimes committed in broad daylight and sometimes in religious sites and in a ro where roles were reversed people became accomplices to unacceptable horrible acts that were generalized one has to remember to appreciate and uh, measure the pride uh, that Rwanda feels today since that horrible day. And those horrors that seemed to have irreversibly annihilated R Rwanda, the country has risen up with people being equal and all structured around a same goal to develop collectively. Let's revisit the journey that you have walked. I'm talking about reconciliation of hearts and spirits and consciences. And these mind, the, 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 this was done thanks to judicial resources and mechanisms and approaches based on African wisdom. It was enlightened by political will characterized by determination to attain the goal as you uh, allowed Rwanda to rebound, to bounce back and move towards the future. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President Paul Kagame. Within an African environment and uh, an international environment full of conflicts based on tribalism, racism, religious divide, uh, cultural, econ economical, even physicalizational, Rwanda very humbly offers a model which resonates positively beyond the borders of Africa and uh, goes into a universalist typology. You should be proud of that, dear brothers and sisters of Rwanda. This uh, is also uh, clarified and exemplified by uh, methodical reconstruction of a social order uh, within the reconciliation setting. So how not to honor the genius of the Rwandan people that has been able, under exemplary leadership at all levels, to transcend all those fragilities of a human being. And lastly, as I analyze this, one needs to, we need to remember to renew our oath for never again, never again. This is also a, 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 an oath to be faithful and uh, to be uh, empathetic and to be in solidarity uh, in terms of links uh, among the humanity of all people. The African Union and uh, all the nations that have been uh, um, impacted by this horrible tragedy against Tutsis did not, like other international actors, did not uh, did not find appropriate res uh, re responses. This is a, a historical reminder. Uh, and uh, we've been reminded of this, of that even a few minute, moments ago. Nobody, I say nobody, not even the African Union, cannot deny its inaction vis-a-vis -vis a preventable genocide. Let's be courageous to acknowledge that and to admit that as well. It's not too high a price if you look at the victims and their descendants. Africa rejects 
is the criminal genocide ideology, which is often falsely justified, pr promoting hatred, supremacy, and all forms of the exclusion and uh, denial of the other. So may I announce within this context to nominate as we commemorate for the 30th time, nominate a special envoy for our multi-form action against the genocide. And I name Mr. Adama Dieng, who worked for a long time in the ICTR in Arusha about the genocide against the Tutsis and worked elsewhere within the United Nations on similar problems. Your Excellencies, the 30th commemoration of the genocide against Tutsis resonates uh, in our hearts and uh, reminds us to surpass ourselves and transcend ourselves higher and higher, higher than the heights of the thousand hills that characterize this country, higher than this blossoming tree higher in terms of human values of humanism with inclusive of inclusive prosperity and collective happiness and shared happiness may the living remain faithful to this earth may the dead who live in our conscience rest in peace in eternal peace i thank you for your attention Excellence, Your Excellency, Mr. Musa Faki Mahamat, thank you for being on, um, uh, here with us. Now I invite His Excellency Charles Michel, President of the European Council, to give his remarks. Over to you, Your Excellency. Monsieur le Président de la Mr. President, the President of the Republic, Paul Kagame, First Lady Jeanette Kagame, Excellences, Heads of States and Governments, ladies and gentlemen. Silence. Silence is the respect. Silence means uh, reflection and silence is also commemoration in, in communion about the genocide against Tutsis. We hear the noise il y a 30 ans. Et j'ai, en me tenant devant vous, en mémoire ce témoignage d'un enfant, il avait à l'époque l'âge de mes enfants, il s'appelle Réverien, et il décrit sa maman du retour du marché en avril 1994, qui lui dit sa peur, qui lui dit qu'il faut prier, parce que la fin approche. La veille... Because the end was near. Because neighbors had come home and they had uh, sto stolen the cattle and property and they were screaming from the other side of the village with uh, the, 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 the screamings because the beginning of the massacre had begun and the morning could be heard the screaming by those killers who had uh, been propagating violence and hatred like poison. And those, that noise and the screaming is also scream by victims who were uh, mutilated. Uh, and those victims include a father, a mother, a child. And those 
screams could be heard from an, a, neighbor, a neighbor's house, from classrooms, schools, churches, at a, road, at a road block, on a road. That noise is also that scream by that person who was being murdered, calling for help, calling for dignity and life. And then the noise became less and less as the machete kept striking, taking lives, more lives, more than a million lives that were decimated. Silence. Silence of those who do not want to see, those who do not want to hear. And that hatred that uh, sharpened the weapons who don't want to see large-scale massacres that had begun the international community that was uh, inactive as part of uh, cowardness. And, and I'm here today before you humbly. I'm Belgian. I'm European. And here we are 30 years later. And I know what my continent, Europe, owes yours, Africa. I know the history with those roots, that greatness. I also know history with that shame. I, I know their responsibilities. And it's within the spirit that the Belgian government in 2000 sought forgiveness. The duty to remember is, first of all, uh, the duty to remember, to not forget, and to learn from the mistakes and to try to start a world that is more enlightened. The European continent knows that the past has also been murderous or, and suffered by the, the, the two world wars that affected the whole world, but also these Shoah the industrial extermination, the systematic extermination of the Jewish people and the, con the European continent uh, decided to pursue justice, forgiveness, and reconciliation to try and build a positive project that looked towards the future. Like Rwanda, a people that opted for justice, forgiveness, reconciliation, and turned towards education, health, infrastructure, technology. This is a, a journey of development and resilience. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you 30 years later, this is 2024, in a world uh, which is in disorder, it's chaotic, a world faced with uh, shocks of another generation conflicts with nature that is a challenge to humanity even though we have this technology artificial intelligence uh, these are uh, uh, computers powerful computers there's evolution but there is a a world based on the rules that are a paradox today human intelligence that produces a lot of in inimaginable technologies a few years ago. At the same time, it's a world with many injustices, inequalities, discrimination, and conflicts. As we uh, talk about different continents in this chaotic world, we think that human dignity, uh, the fight against discrimination that is uh, against that you, you and charter should be should be paid attention to we condemn strongly the terrorist act by Hamas in Gaza and we demand unconditional release of the hostages we also uh, you know within the European Council 
that there be humanitarian access and a ceasefire uh, and to respect uh, the International Court of Justice's decisions. Mr. President, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, on this land of a thousand hills, this green land 30 years ago, the absolute horror struck personal suffering, a lot of personal suffering and strategy. But the choice was that of reconciliation, reconstruction slowly, consistently, word after word, and forgiveness to rebuild, to repair the social fabric that based on dignity uh, on behalf of each human being, reconciliation between neighbors, communities, and as a country. That requires courage and a strong will. It's also the condition to to, to to reach this tree of light that represents hope everywhere. Carry this light of dignity. And that's a commitment that we need to take together. And that's my wish that we follow this path. Thank you for your attention. We, we thank our, our guests who came here to uh, comfort us in this moment and for their remarks. Now we're going to welcome Len Gabo and Aline Sano in their performance. This beautiful, oh, beautiful country. Even though there's been a lot of tears and pain, they've gone through all that, but we're still alive. Even though we thought that night was going to go on forever. We're here, we're alive, and we are, we are rebuilding our lives. Rwanda, you've lost your sons and daughters. They will never come back. But they live in our hearts that we, we bring here and we honor them as we rebuild. Those orphans and widows have recovered hope.
abahanzi barakoze banacyubahiro bashitsi bahire tugize mu mwanya wo kwakira ijambo nyamukuru cy'uyu munsi your excellency president paul kagame we now invite you to deliver your keynote message Dear friends, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, and First Ladies, former Heads of State and Government, and former First Ladies, and Heads of Delegations. Special Guests, Banyar Gwanda, Mwez. Awanyarguanda ndivu sabe kwa mwenye hanga nila. Mwa kwa meza ilijambo. Mururi mi. Awa ishisi watu. Bari ushawere kumbaneza. Today. Our hearts are filled with grief and gratitude in equal measure. We remember our dead and are also grateful for what Rwanda has become. To the survivors among us, we are in your debt. We asked you to do the impossible by carrying the burden of reconciliation on your shoulders and you continue to do so, continue to do the impossible for our nation every single day, and we thank you. As the years pass, the descendants of survivors increasingly struggle with the quiet loneliness of longing for relatives they never met or never even got the chance to be born. Today, we are thinking of you as well. Our tears flow inward, but we carry on as a family. Countless Rwandans also resisted the call to genocide. Some paid the ultimate price for that courage and we honor their memory. Our journey has been long and tough. Rwanda was completely humbled by the magnitude of our loss. And the lessons we learned are engraved in blood. But the tremendous progress of our country is plain to see 
and it is the result of the choices we made together to resurrect our nation. The foundation of everything is unity. That was the first choice, to believe in the idea of a reunited Rwanda and live accordingly. The second choice was to reverse the arrow of accountability, which used to point outwards beyond our borders. Now, we are accountable to each other, above all. Most importantly, we chose to think beyond the horizon of tragedy and become a people with a future. Today, we also feel a particular gratitude to all the friends and representatives here with us from around the world. We are deeply honored by your presence alongside us on this very heavy day. The contributions you have made to Rwanda's rebirth are enormous and have helped us to stand where we are now. I want to recognize a few while also asking for forgiveness for not being able to mention all who deserve it. For example, Uganda, which carried the burden of Rwanda's internal problems for so many years and was even blamed for that. The leadership and the people of Ethiopia and Eritrea helped us in starting to rebuild at that time. In fact, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who is here, even served as a young peacekeeper in the immediate aftermath of the genocide. There is Kenya, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo hosted large members and numbers of Rwandan refugees and gave them a home. Tanzania, as well, and also played a unique role at many critical points, including hosting and facilitating the Arusha peace process. And here, I must single out the late President Julius Nyerere, who embodied the spirit which laid that foundation. The Republic of Congo has been a productive partner in rebuilding and more. Many of the countries represented here today also sent their sons and daughters to serve as peacekeepers in Rwanda. Those soldiers 
did not fail Rwanda. It was the international community which failed all of us, whether from contempt or cowardice. Among those here with us today, I salute the widow and daughter of the late Captain Mbai Dian of Senegal, who died a hero as he rescued many Rwandans from death. At the United Nations Security Council in 1994, more clarity came from Nigeria, the Czech Republic, and even as far away as New Zealand. Their ambassadors had the courage to call the genocide by its rightful name and resist political pressure from more powerful countries to hide the truth. Ambassador Ibrahim Gambari of Nigeria and Czech Ambassador Carol Covenda are here with us today and we applaud you. Even in countries where government policy was on the wrong side of history, both during the genocide and even afterwards, there were always individuals who stood out for their honesty and humanity. We shall always be grateful. We also appreciate the tangible support we have received from partners beyond our continent over the past 30 years in Europe, the United States, Asia, and many international organizations and philanthropies. A notable example of solidarity came to us from South Africa. One among many. Indeed, the entire arc, the entire arc of our continent's hopes and agonies could be seen in those few months of 1994. As South Africa ended apartheid and elected Nelson Mandela president in Rwanda, the last genocide of the 20th century was being carried out. The new South Africa paid for Cuban doctors to help rebuild our shattered health system and opened up its universities to Rwandan students paying only local fees. Among the hundreds of students who benefited from South Africa's generosity, some were orphaned survivors, others were the children of perpetrators, and many were neither. Most have gone on to become leaders in our country in different fields. Today, they live 
a completely new life. What lessons have really been learned about the nature of genocide and the value of life? I want to share a personal story, which I usually keep to myself. My cousin, in fact, a sister, Florence, worked for the United Nations Development Program in Rwanda for more than 15 years. After the genocide started, she was trapped in her house near the Camp Kigali Army Barracks with her niece and other children and neighbors, around a dozen people in total. The telephone in Francis's house still worked, and I called her several times using my satellite phone. Each time we spoke, she was more desperate. But her forces could not reach the area. When the command of the UN peacekeeping mission General Dariel visited me where I was in Mulindi. I asked him to rescue Florence. He said he would try. The last time I talked to her, I asked her if anyone had come. She said no, and started crying. Then she said, Paul, you should stop trying to save us. We don't want to live anymore anyway. I quickly understood what she was saying. And she hung up. At that time, I had a very strong heart, but it weakened a bit because I understood what she was trying to tell me. On the, May, on the morning of May 16th, following a month of torture, they were all killed, except for one niece who managed to escape, and thanks to a good neighbor. It later emerged that uh, a Rwandan working at the UNDP betrayed his Tutsi colleagues to the killers. Witnesses remember him celebrating that, celebrating Florence's mother the night after the attack. He continued his career with the United Nations for many years, 
even after evidence implicating him emerged. He's still a free man, now living in France. I asked General Darrell what happened. He said that his soldiers encountered a militia roadblock near the house. And so they turned back just like that. Meanwhile, he conveyed to me an order from the United States ambassador to protect diplomats and foreign, uh, and foreign civilians evacuating from or by road to Burundi from attack by the militias. These two things happen at the same time. I do not need to be instructed to do something that goes without saying. That's what I was going to do. But the militias ran away, or, or, or rather peacekeepers ran away from militias, were manning a roadblock, Um, I do not blame General Darrell. He's a good man who did the best that could be done in the worst conditions imaginable and who has consistently borne witness to the truth despite the personal cost. Nevertheless, in the contrast between the two cases, I took note of the value that is attached to different shades of life. In 1994, all Tutsi were supposed to be completely exterminated once and for all because the killings that had forced me and hundreds of thousands of others into exile three decades before had not been sufficiently thorough. That is why even the babies were systematically murdered so they would not grow up to become fighters. Rwandans will never understand why any country would remain intentionally vague about who was targeted in the genocide. I don't understand it. Such ambiguity is in fact a form of denial which is a crime in and of itself. And Rwanda will always challenge it. When the genocidal forces fled to Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, in July 1994, with the support of the external backers, they vowed to reorganize 
and return to complete the genocide. They conducted hundreds of cross-border terrorist attacks inside Rwanda over the next five years, targeting not only survivors, but also other Rwandans who had refused to go into exile, claiming thousands more lives. The remnants of those forces are still in Eastern Congo today, where they enjoy state support in full view of the United Nations peacekeepers Their objectives have not changed. And the only reason this group today, known as FDRR, has not been disbanded is because Their continued existence serves some unspoken interest. As a result, hundreds of thousands of Congolese Tutsi refugees live here in our country, in Rwanda, and beyond completely forgotten, and no program of action for their safe return. Have we really learned any lessons? We see too many actors even some from Africa, getting directly involved as tribal politics is given renewed prominence and ethnic cleansing is prepared and practiced. What has happened to us? Is this the Africa we want to live in? Is this the kind of world we want? Wanda's tragedy is a warning. The process of division and extremism which leads to genocide can happen anywhere if left unchecked. Throughout history, survivors of mass atrocities are always expected to be quiet, to censor themselves, or else be erased and even blamed for their own misfortune. Their testimony is living evidence of complicity and it unsettles the fictions which comfort the enablers and the bystanders. The more Rwanda takes full responsibility for its own safety and dignity, the more intensely the established truth about the genocide is questioned and revised. Over time, in the media controlled by the powerful in the world, in this world, 
Victims are rebranded as villains. And even this very moment of commemoration is derived as a mere political tactic. It is not. It never has been. Our reaction to such a hypocrisy is a pure disgust. We commemorate because those lives mattered to us. Rwandans cannot afford to be indifferent to root causes of genocide. We will always pay maximum attention even if we are alone. But what we are seeking is solidarity and partnership to recognize and confront these threats together as a global community. I will tell you another story. One night, in the letter, Days of the Genocide, I received a surprise visit past midnight from General Darrell. He brought a written message of which I still uh, have a copy from the French general commanding the force that uh, France had just deployed in the western part of our country that uh, operation to cause. The message said that we would pay a heavy price, meaning those of us, the RPF, if our forces dared to try to capture the town of Butari, that is in the southern part of our country. So, and General Darrell gave me additional advice. He said, uh, in fact, he warned me. He said that uh, the French had uh, attacked helicopters and all kinds of arms. Every kind of heavy weapon you can imagine. And therefore, we are prepared to use them against us if we did not comply. I asked Darrell, I asked him whether French soldiers bleed the same way ours do. I asked him whether we have blood in our bodies. Then I, I, I thanked him and I told him that uh, he should just go and have rest and, and sleep and have his sleep after 
uh, after giving uh, after informing the French that our response would follow, and it did. I immediately radioed the, the commander of the forces that were actually in that direction, in that area, is called uh, Fred Ibinjira. And, and told him to get ready to move. And move to fight. We took Vutare, which we were being warned not to enter, uh, we took that town at dawn. Within weeks, the entire country had been secured. And we began rebuilding. We did not have the kind of arms that were being used to threaten us. But I reminded some people that uh, this is our land, this is our country. Uh, those who bleed will bleed over it. We had lost all fear. Each challenge or indignity just made us stronger. After the genocide, we faced the puzzle of how to prevent it from recurring. There were three broad lessons we learned as a result of our experience. First, only we as Rwandans and Africans can give full value to our lives. After all, we cannot ask others to value African lives more highly than we ourselves do. That is the root of our duty to preserve memory and tell our history as we lived it. Second, Never wait for rescue or ask for permission to do what is right to protect people. And that's why some people must be joking when uh, they threaten us with all kinds of things and they don't know what they are talking about. But in any case, that's why Rwanda participates proudly in the peacekeeping operations today and also extends assistance to African brothers and sisters bilaterally when asked. Third,
stand firm against the politics of ethnic populism in any form. Genocide is populism in its purified form. Because the causes are political, the remedies must be as well. For that reason, our politics is not organized on the basis of ethnicity or religion, and it never will be again. The life of my generation has been a recurring cycle of genocidal violence in 30-year intervals from the early 1960s to 1994 to the signs we see in our region today in 2024. Only a new generation of young people have the ability to renew and redeem a nation after genocide. Our job was to provide the space and the tools for them to break the cycle and they have. What gives us hope and confidence are the children we saw in the performance area or the youth who created the tradition of work to remember that will occur later today. Near the three quarters of Rwandans today are under age 35. They either have no memory of the genocide or were not yet born. Our youth are the guardians of our future. And the foundation of our unity with a mindset that is totally different from the generation before. Today, it is all Rwandans who have conquered fear. Nothing can be worse than what we have already experienced. This is a nation of 14 million people who are ready to confront any attempt to take us backwards. The Rwandan story shows how much power human beings have within them. Whatever power you do have, you might as well use it to tell the truth and do what is right. During the genocide, people were sometimes given the option of paying for a less painful death. There is another story. I learned about at the time, which always sticks in my mind, about a woman at a roadblock in her final moments She left us a lesson 
that even uh, every African should live by. Every African should live by this lesson. When asked by the killers how she wanted to die, she looked them in the eye. and the spit in their face. Today, because of the accident of survival, our only choice is what life we want to live. Our people will never, and I mean never, be left for dead again. I thank you. Your Excellency, thank you very much for these words of truth and reminding us that we will always stand up against primitive politics. Now, distinguished guests, as we are coming to the end of this ceremony, we are going to hear the last musical interlude, which will be performed by Ruti Joel, Mani Martin, Bukuru Christian, Aline Sano, Nel Ngawo, and Kenny Mirasano, to reinterpret a song by the late Cyprien Rugamba, who was killed during the genocide. The song is called Morumve Tkwanatkwanyi. Zihira nechami, umenye kunda, umenye kunda. 
Abahanzi barakoze reka twongere tubashimira baririmbye bose kubera ko We thank the artists They've just clarified that no matter what happens life goes on generation after generation as they've been uh, performing the songs by uh, uh, the singers who are no longer with us. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic, Honorable Dignitaries, Rwandans, and all of those following, we thank you once again for being with us in this function as we start the week of commemorate, remembrance as we commemorate the genocide against Tutsis. Kuibuka activities will continue for the next 100 days, so please stand by the survivors of the genocide against the Tutsis. Let's keep remembering as we rebuild. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of the ceremony. We thank you all for being with us and for standing by us on this important occasion as we honor those we lost, those who survived, those who saved lives, and those who fought and continue to fight for the country we have today. As we close this ceremony, marking the start of the 30th commemoration, we please ask that we continue to remember, unite, and renew. Please remain in your place as the heads of states and delegated officials depart. <laughs> 